Okay, we're going to be taking a look at the properties of water. One of the most fantastic things. Take some time to think about what is so fantastic about water. All right, are you done? Okay, great. Uh, water molecules, we're going to be looking at many different things here. Just a few of the things that you should be thinking about. Water molecules are sticky. What does that mean? We're going to do a few different activities that are going to demonstrate in this in class. But um, if you know that a water molecule is actually H2O, H2O, well, I can actually circle each one of these as an H2O. There's kind of hidden behind there. Here's another H. 2O with an oxygen and two hydrogens attached to it. It's kind of a bent angle here. But uh, when water molecules actually form together and turn into the solid structure of ice, they actually turn into this very interesting arrangement here. And there are certain bonds here that are called hydrogen bonds. We're going to see that in a second. But uh, a few things to write down. That's the general shape. Water is a polar molecule. Polar molecule. And what that means is when you're looking at a diagram like this, um, it means that oxygen and hydrogen, comparatively, one of them attracts electrons closer to it uh, more than the other, and oxygen is said to be more electronegative. Oops, you're not going to see the rest of that. Electronegative. And what that means is the electrons that are shared in the bonds here are pulled more closely towards oxygen, and so you end up with this it's called delta negative, a partial negative charge, and the hydrogens end up with a partial positive. That's very important. Partial negative on the oxygen and partial uh, positives. That's a delta sign. It's just a, looks kind of like a little musical note. I don't even know if mine's that pretty. But partial negative, partial positive. So we have these partial charges here. That's what makes it polar. Polar, as we'll see in a little moment. It means it's good at interacting with other substances that are also polar. So there it is. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, therefore pulls electrons more closely. The force of attraction between these water molecules is called a hydrogen bond. So you can see in the background image here what's represented by these dotted lines is that if an oxygen molecule is partially negative and partially positive, well, if I put another, uh, let's try to do this, if I have one water molecule like this and this side is negative and this side is positive well if I have another water molecule close by and uh, not a lot of energy then what's gonna happen is actually the negative is going to be attracted to the positive over here and then you end up with this kind of arrangement so check this out and this is exactly what the structure of ice actually ends up looking like. A negative charge here is going to stabilize these. So you can see the water molecule, uh, this is positive, right? That's my oxygen with a negative. You end up with a very open structure with lots of space in between. And this is going to explain one thing that's very special about ice. Um, and that is that ice is one of the only liquid substances, probably maybe the only that I know of, um, that when it's in its solid form, it actually floats. So ice actually floats on top of water. Most other substances, when they turn into a solid or freeze, they sink to the bottom. So very important for life. All right. There's another big diagram showing the same thing, the structure of ice. Notice how the molecules are all spread out. In between the water molecules here, you can see, if you can identify what the water molecules are. This is an H2O, it's right here. That's one water molecule. So these kind of blue grayish lines are actually the hydrogen bonds that are forming between the negatively charged oxygen atom and the positively charged hydrogen atom. Those are the hydrogen bonds. So these bonds are really, really important when we talk about the properties of water. Okay, So things that make water special, a lot of it has to do with hydrogen bonding, which is very, very strong. So you can see some additional bonds there. Another close-up diagram. There's a water molecule uh, in their center here, surrounded by other, mar other, other water molecules, and you can see that these orange dots are representing the hydrogen bonds that form between the water molecules. These hydrogen bonds are very strong, and uh, they are the ones that have to be broken when ice actually melts and evaporates. So in the solid structure of water, in ice, you get that very regular structure that we saw early with a lot of earlier with a lot of open space, which means that ice ends up being less 
dense than liquid water. And the lower density is what causes it to float. So some basic understanding of density uh, you should know from there. Okay, water is a universal solvent. It, what that means is most things left in water for, if you give it enough time, uh, it can do a pretty good job breaking things down. Uh, but it depends on the substances. And here's a word here, hydrophilic. If you've heard of the word audiophile, it means someone who loves music. Or there are other examples of blank files. Uh, philic um, means to love or to like. So water is considered hydrophilic. Obviously, it likes water. But any a substance that likes water is, con is considered hydrophilic as well. So polar and ionic substances have charges and are attracted to the charges of water molecules and dissolve easily. So salt over here is an example. NaCl, NaCl quickly dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions, and salt is something that actually dissolves very easily in water. Okay? Same thing can be said for glucose and other polar ionic substances. Hydrophobic is a word that refers to not liking water or being repelled. If you've heard of any kind of phobia, if you have a phobia, arachnophobia means fear of spiders. Claustrophobia means fear of confined or small spaces. Hydrophobia means fear of water or dislike of water. So obviously you probably have learned before that oil and water uh, don't mix very well and if you pour oil into a cup of water the oil is going to form a layer on the top so why is that why doesn't the oil mix and disperse easily or dissolve in the water it's because oil is hydrophobic and um, I guess we could go a little bit further fatty acids when you look at fatty acids they have long chains of carbon when you see long chains of carbon in the molecule that usually means that at least that part of the molecule is not going to like water and is not going to mix with water. Therefore, for it will be hydrophobic. Okay. So here's some salt water. What happens when you dissolve the salt into the water? You end up with a diagram that looks something like this. You can see because of the positive charges, because of the positive charges and negative charges, and then these positive charges and negative charges, uh, there's going to be a lot of a pulling force basically that's occurring. And so here you can see a chloride ion already surrounded by three water molecules. These are all positively charged. And the positive ion of the salt molecule, sodium, is being surrounded by all the negatively charged oxygens. And so that's pretty much what's happening when you're dissolving salt. So due to water's polar nature, the positive and negative poles of the water molecule are effective at separating ionic substances like NaCl. Make sure you get that down. Okay, another property here is cohesion. Water exhibits cohesion. Cohesion is a word, you might have heard the word adhesion. Cohesion and adhesion mean different things. Cohesion is when molecules of the of a similar or same substance stick together. So when one water, water ah, what's the word? when one water molecule attracts to another water molecule, we call that cohesion. When a water molecule attracts to another substance like a wall, uh, when when water sticks to a wall or water sticks to the surface of your fingers or something, we call that adhesion. I'll write that down here. Adhesion versus cohesion. And in water, this is due to hydrogen bonding when we're talking about cohesion. When the water molecules stick to each other, it's that invisible bond we talked about earlier called hydrogen bonding. Because of this action, because of this stickiness of the water molecules, uh, plants, this is how plants can take water up. Um, if you're just talking about a small little sunflower, it doesn't seem like it's too difficult. But when you're talking about you know, evergreen trees or sequoia trees, some giant, giant trees in, in forests, redwoods and things like that. They are also taking up water through this process and it doesn't even make any noise. You know, if you think of a fire engine that's trying to pump water all the way up to like a third floor, think about how loud that fire engine is and how much energy is being required to pump the water all the way up there against gravity. Plants can do this relatively easily because they're using really thin tubes, uh, really thin tubes and using the property of water called uh, cohesion. And it's hydrogen bonding that's pulling up the actual chain of water molecules. You'll see this in transpiration as well. Transpiration refers to the 
pull of water up through a plant and out through its leaves. Another thing here, these kinds of bugs called water striders that look like they can walk on water. It's like magical. Uh, you're going to see this property in class as well. It's uh, referred to as surface tension. You'll see this a little bit later, surface tension. So what ends up happening is because of the hydrogen bonding between the water molecules at the surface, water molecules at the surface of a pool of water behave very differently than uh, in the water themselves. And so it creates this very strong film and animals and plants can take advantage of that by in essence floating on top but it's not quite uh it's not floating necessarily that's allowing them allowing them to do that it's exactly this surface tension created by hydrogen bonding at the surface of any kind of water pool okay and there's a little box referring to adhesion that i mentioned earlier it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. So another property of water is that it has a high specific heat capacity and a high latent heat of vaporization. In easy terms, it basically means that water molecules can absorb a lot of energy within the molecule itself. So let's pick a color here. So water molecules can absorb a lot of energy in these bonds over here. They can absorb a lot of energy And so, therefore, this is very good for homeostasis, for oceans, ocean temperatures. They don't fluctuate very much, and they can absorb a lot of energy before they actually change state. And so the, the, the energy gets absorbed, and you don't get a apparent change in temperature. Um, but this is an important property for supporting life on Earth, and also for sweating. So when you sweat, What's happening is your arterioles, this relates to homeostasis as well, but your, your skin arterioles, you may notice that they kind of stick out a little bit. For, for me, they do at least a lot compared to the winter. And during the summertime, I start to sweat a lot, and that sweat evaporates from my body. When the sweat evaporates, it's taking away heat. So that's actually a programmed in response to help cool you down so when that sweat evaporates away it's taking in it's taking away a lot of the heat that's built up in your body and that heat is actually a lot of it is transferred in your blood so the skin arterioles stick out a little bit but that's just to bring them closer to the surface so that heat can be transferred to sweat and when the sweat evaporates it takes away a lot of that heat so this high specific heat capacity just means that water molecules can absorb a lot of energy Okay, this is an easy one. Water is transparent. Why is that important? Think about it. Well, it's transparent, not necessarily for this, but because it's transparent, it can support a lot of life underwater. So, of course, not all plants are land-based. In fact, the first plants were probably, were, were definitely in the water. And photosynthesis, photosynthesis uh, requires a lot of light. And if, if water was not actually transparent, then light would not be able to uh, penetrate the surface and you wouldn't be able to allow photosynthesis to happen and if this happens here then you get oxygen being produced oxygen can get dissolved in the water and then you can support um, animals that use oxygen for respiration so water transparency really important Transparency, we talked about surface tension, we talked about ice floats on water. These are all significant for life. This would be a good basis if you had to give a presentation or describe the importance, just how significant uh, water is to life. And on Earth, it's all liquid. And that's a good thing as well, too. So basic things here, just take note. Transparency allows light to reach photosynthesizing organisms. Surface tension contributes to habitats for various plants and things that live on water, uh, mosquitoes laying their eggs, ice floats on water. I'll talk about this a little bit more right here. So this is significant because if ice is less dense, so the solid form of water is less dense, it actually floats. And so if you look at a lake from the side, so here's a, a lake. And if water freezes, it forms a solid layer on the top. Now this is great for anybody who wants to go ice skating or anything like that, but actually all this still, still remains liquid down here. So imagine big lakes supporting a lot of life down here. If everything froze through solid, 
if we did not have this phenomenon where ice actually floats, then the whole lake would freeze over and it would kill everything that's actually in there. But because only the top layer freezes, it acts like a blanket, an insulator. It keeps the temperature down here uh, above freezing point. Everything is still liquid. The fish are still flowing around here and then the plants are still alive and it actually forms an insulating layer. So this allows life to actually continue um, in really cold temperatures. So that is A-OK. -okay. We like that. Here's a quick question for you to look at. What property of water makes it a good evaporative coolant? So I haven't used this particular phrase here, but you should be able to break it down. So which one of these do you think contributes the most to allowing water to be a good evaporative coolant? Pause the video and take a, a minute and think about it. Another one. What is the difference between cohesion and adhesion from a 2011 paper? So this, usually these questions, I mean, these questions are intended for after you've covered every other topic. So if you're doing higher level, you would have learned about plant uh, science as well, too, eventually. And so that's going to be important here. I mentioned transpiration pole before and movement of water in the soil. So think about this one. This is a little more challenging. Uh, pause the video and then take a look. Okay, the answer is D, adhesion. Only adhesion involves interaction of water with xylem. Remember, adhesion means interaction between two different substances. So xylem are the tubes that help to carry up water in plants, if you've learned this before, or you're looking at this after you've covered the plant science unit. So water molecules interacting with xylem are two different substances, so it's adhesion. All of these other ones are wrong because in transpiration pool, water is attaching to other water molecules, so that's cohesion because they're the same substances. Uh, movement of water in the soil, there's going to be cohesion between the water molecules, but also adhesion of the water molecules attached to soil particles. And for C, only cohesion involves interaction of water with soil. So interaction of water with soil, that's going to be adhesion. Okay. All right, please post any questions. Water is great for life. Go have a cup.